Authors at Google New York is uh, pleased to have Professor Ying Zhu come and speak to us today. Please welcome Professor Zhu. Thanks, and thanks for uh, having me here. Um, I think I will start by actually, instead of talking about China Central Television, I wanted to show you something else, and which I think you're all familiar with, actually. Uh, so this is an interesting video clip of a Korean pop si uh, singer Sai doing his Gangnam style song and dance sequence. <laughs> to Wikipedia as of January of this year, the first January of, uh, 1st of this year, uh, this music video has been viewed over 1.10 uh, billion times. You know, I just clicked a, a couple of more times into it. So, and, and this, uh, on the YouTube, of course, and this is the site's most watched video. Now, the question is, what does this slice of K-pop have anything to do with uh, Chinese media or China Central Television? Well, nothing much. And this missing link is precisely what I wanted to call your attention to today. Um, what the South, Korean, uh, the South Koreans have accomplished via this funky uh, music video is what the Chinese state media have been craving for uh, to promote name recognition and, and make people desire what you desire. Uh, in other words, that is to project China's soft power. But Chinese media have yet to come up with such a pop hit to boost its uh, soft power. Now, the lack of recognition or desirability of Chinese soft power is not due to lack of trying, as billions uh, you know, have, have been spent in promoting China's soft power globally. And the Chinese government invested 7.8 billion alone in 2009 uh, to facilitate Chinese media's global uh, soft power campaign. And all the money has gone to major state-run media firms, including China Central Television. Now, the global image campaign was launched by the Chinese state over a decade ago, back in 2001. The goal was to change China's international image, which was for the most part negative. The Chinese Communist Party warned Chinese media, uh, media practitioners, that it would be unrealistic to expect uh, the West to promote China's cause and perspective. Um, but a decade later and many billions after, uh, the overall international image of China continues to be, uh, to put it mildly, uh, uncool. Even the Chinese uh, President Hu Jintao acknowledged a year ago uh, the dismal record of Chinese soft power, telling the party that, quote, the overall strength of Chinese culture and its international influence is not commensurate with China's international uh, status." Unquote. So what was his solution? Well, not size Gangnam style K-pop, that's for sure. The popular and the grassroots have no place in China's image campaign. In fact, the satirical and rebellious Gangnam style might even be considered unseemly to China's censors and cultural guardians. Instead, Hu Jintao encouraged the development of Chinese national culture uh, rooted in Confucian tradition capable of countering Western cultural influence. So a state-manufactured and, and managed Chinese national culture is the prescription the party has in mind uh, for the people and for the rest of the world. Never mind that the world might not be all that interested in what the CCP has to preach. But this sort of heavy-handed approach is nothing new. Now, in China, culture is to enlighten uh, rather than entertain, and then the media is to guard the purity and quality of Chinese culture. And the media, of course, must also uh, serve the party. Now, to be fair to the Chinese Communist Party, the subservience of culture to politics is not the party's invention. 
It is rooted in longer tradition, much longer tradition of Chinese aesthetics that defines art and culture as the good and the beautiful. The Chinese cultural tradition puts a greater emphasis on the responsibility of art in the normalization of society, as opposed to a Western tradition of art as, as, as a critical vanguard or individual expression. Now, to this end, Western culture is often perceived as a source of decadence and evil for polluting the purity of Chinese culture. And thus, China has time and again waged wars against the cultural vulgarity and degradation, uh, seen again as a result of Western culture pollution or erosion. The K-pop video can easily be uh, condemned as vulgar, a cheap knockoff of Western-style pop music. Now, in January last year, the Chinese President Hu Jintao urged Chinese cultural policymakers to, quote, clearly see that international hostile forces are intensifying the strategic plot of westernizing and dividing China, and ideological and cultural fields are the focal areas of their long-term infrastruction, end quote. And, and, and he said further that, quote, we should deeply understand the seriousness and complexity of the ideological struggle, always sound alarm and remain vigilant and take forceful measures to be on guard and respond, end quote. Now, though reminiscent of Cold War rhetoric, this sort of militant talk is nothing new in China. And to be fair, West has, uh, over the years, harbored similar apprehension and distrust towards China, particularly China's rise in the past decade. So the feeling is somewhat mutual, let's just put it that way. Uh, except that in China, the state can quickly enact policies that aim to deter Western cultural uh, pollution. And in October 2011, China banned scores of racy and overtly materialistic entertainment shows on primetime uh, prime television in an effort to curb excessive entertainment, exemplified by a Chinese dating show on a local satellite television, If You Are the One, in which provocatively dressed young women are uh, uh, par paraded on stage um, blatantly embracing materialism. I think I have that queued up here. My father told me to say a sentence, I hope you can get married today. Do you like children? I like to wear OL clothes. Is this a little bit of a joke? Wang Peijie is the executive producer of If You Are The One. The show is a window through which we can look at our society. Reality TV shows like If You Are The One have become common on Chinese television. The winning formula has attracted fans and ad revenue. I think the conversations between the male and female contestants reflect the attitudes and concerns of people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. I think they authentically represent the current state of things in China. But the sometimes racy and materialistic content has also attracted the attention of China's censors. This type of content is relatively new for China. In the past, television's main purpose was to spread propaganda need more propaganda here. Now, uh, these material girls and, and boys, you know, from other reality programs, have seriously offended old party comrades and conservative cultural commentators and, and viewers alike. And new rules were promptly issued, forcing all satellite TV stations across China to cut vulgar uh, entertainment programs, essentially reducing a weekly entertainment programs to two during prime time. Furthermore, and as a counter-programming strategy, and at least one show during prime time must be about promoting, quote, traditional Chinese virtues, core socialist values, and advanced cultures, uh, unquote. Now, the battle against Western culture pollution, uh, Western po uh, popular culture is equated with ins uh, ensuring China's uh, cultural security. So it's a serious matter. Uh, the Chinese state's cultural anxiety was keenly felt in 2011, a year when Avatar pretty much dominated the Chinese box office and Lady Gaga uh, was a household name, popular among the Chinese uh, young and old. Um, in Chinese states, 
Now, actually, to demonstrate Lady Gaga's popularity in China, I wanted to uh, take the liberty here to play a clip from Hunan Satellite TV's rendition of Lady Gaga's 2009 hit, Bad Romance. Only that the song is now sung in Hunan's Changsa dialect, <laughs> and no less by a senior choir. And, and bear in mind that in this region of, of China, uh, the, the word Gaga means grandmother. Right? And not, I'm not sure if the lady would be pleased with this kind of connection, the connotation, the image of grandmother and Lady Gaga. Um, so, and the segment is part of Hunan Satellite Television's Mid Autumn Festival Gala. Mid Autumn Festival, uh, for some of you might, might know, is an occasion for family gathering and reunion in China. And, and the choir changed Gaga's lyrics uh, to be about the elderly empty nesters yearning for the grow, uh, grown up children and grandchildren to come home and visit. Let's, let's have a sample of this. This is going to be very uh, interesting. taste. Uh, well, so is this Western culture pollution or, or, or Eastern, you know, uh, cultural ap appropriation or subversion? And to use Lady Gaga to preach for Confucian family value seems to me pretty cool, <laughs> uh, especially coming from, a, you know, a very, a group of a, a very euphoric uh, senior citizens. Uh, Regardless, the Chinese uh, authority was not amused by the flood of Western-infused the Chinese uh, programs produced, uh, mostly by China's provincial TV stations, uh, therefore the crackdown. And, but the crackdowns do hurt Chinese television's bottom line. Now, though state-owned uh, and controlled, Chinese television is by now financially self-reliant and operationally autonomous. So when it comes to chasing ratings, it functions just the same as the US commercial networks. Right? You have three bright mice, you know, I was told, uh, since a decade ago with networks competing for ratings. Now, uh, what is different is that in China, one network is granted greater leverage in market share. And that network is, of course, China Central Television, uh, the only national TV network in China um, to understand how China Central Television attains, obtains its leverage, one must understand China's overall TV structure. Now, China has the so-called four-tier television structure, where television uh, stations were set up at the national, provincial, uh, county, and city levels, and both national and local regulators operate their own TV stations and serve audiences within their own uh, administrative boundaries. Now, as a result, television stations, broadcasting bureaus, and governments at the same administrative levels are closely linked in economic and political exchange. And CCTV is the only broadcaster that is allowed nationwide coverage, although the arrival of cable and satellite television would challenge the kind of a neat structure. So how does satellite television work in China? Well, in China, each provincial TV station is allowed to operate one satellite TV channel with signal coverage capable 
of theoretically capable of reaching the entire nation. But because of the administrative boundaries and local protectionism, uh, provincial satellite TV stations must negotiate with each other uh, to expand their uh, satellite channels. And local broadcasters have managed over the years to extend their regional reach via independent satellite and cable distribution deals with other provincial broadcasters. Uh, it's a bread and butter issue. Now, the central regulator that oversees China Central Television is the State Administration of Radio, Film, and Television, or SAFT in short. Now, SAFT is motivated both politically and economically, uh, understandably, to boost CCTV's market share. And how does it do it? Well, there is the must-carry policy that uh, guarantees the CCTV one's national coverage. CCTV has uh, altogether 24 channels and the big umbrella of CCTV China Central Television. And, and CCTV one is by far the most significant channel that carries uh, network news and other culturally sig uh, significant programs. Now, carrying CCTV one is considered a political mission an undeniable obligation and responsibility of local broadcasters. Then there is the exclusive information available to only CCTV, and then the crackdown on programs uh, utilizing local dialects that appeals to local audiences. Um, as the financial stakes grow uh, higher, local stations rebelled, challenging CCTV's market dominance by producing entertainment programs that would attract audience nationwide. And the youth and entertainment-oriented Hunan Satellite TV, for one, has emerged as CCTV's formidable challenger. If you recall, Hunan TV is the one who made all these, uh, that, that video clip of grandmother and, and parents act up, just to make sure you go home and visit your parents so that they don't act up. Um, so in 2004, uh, Hunan Satellite TV debuted a singing competition show with mobile phone voting. Modeled on American Idol at the show, Supergirls became an overnight rating sensation, pr uh, promoting CCTV to launch a campaign uh, attacking Hunan Satellite Television, calling it a rogue broadcaster with culturally vulgar program. And a top official from Soft echoed CCTV, complaining about what he saw as an excessive amount of low quality and a lowbrow reality shows on Chinese te uh, television. And he wanted to strengthen parties' supervision of entertainment programs and to restrict the number of reality shows allowed on TV. And Soft eventually announced a ban on airing talent shows during prime time, which is you know, somewhere between 7.30 to 10.30 in, in China. Uh, the ban started in 2007. And under the new rules, the programs uh, must be no longer than 90 minutes and offer no prizes to attract contestants. And Supergirls was suspended in 2008 uh, when the Beijing Olympics pretty much uh, preempted everything. And then in 2009, uh, Hunan Television made an attempt to, to relaunch Supergirls, only in a different name, Happy Girls. This time it's called Happy Girls. OK, so let's see if Happy Girls can fail better here. Take a look at these restrictions. So Soft promptly handed down uh, strict conditions for Hunan TV to run Happy Girls. The draconian directives made even my then preteen daughter's wings who complained quite wisely, I should say that, quote, this is ridiculous. Reality TV is all about expression, not the suppression of raw emotions, end quote. Now, here's a segment from the now much subdued Happy Girls, which is actually the opening of the championship competition in 
声，全国十二侠。So how's this for C-pop? Pretty cool. Well, the Chinese cultural guardians would have none of that either. And uh, now, let's marching on. Now, as CCTV is busy battering local stations, it is confronted with yet another phone motherboard challenger. And this time, it's something called the internet. Um, Though television remains the party's most manageable vehicle for cultural engineering, even the Chinese state can control consumer behavior. CCTV has largely become irrelevant to the young and educated population who has you know, pretty much opted for the more open cyberspace. And the end of last year projected that the number of Chinese watching entertainment programs online would surpass 445 million. CCTV has tried to woo audiences back by uh, importing popular movies and TV dramas from the UK and the US, and the most uh, recent lineup include, uh, surprisingly, V for Vendetta, featuring an anti-hero with anti-authoritarian and you know, totalitarian paws. And yes, Downton Abbey. <laughs> now, let's dwell on the internet a bit. The internet has been a very positive force in compelling Chinese state and the media to open up. The internet has made it that much harder for Chinese authorities to shut out undesirable news or keep it out of the traditional media in China. And keeping the news of, let's say, collapsing schools uh, in Sichuan or collapsing governments in the Middle East uh, out of the state media where millions of people can access them online would further drive people away uh, from the traditional media. So the Chinese state gets it. But the compulsive censorship regime will not give it a rest. Internet and social media are subject to very sophisticated monitoring and filtering. Now, official campaigns were launched uh, in China a decade ago to effectively push for internet self-censorship equating diligent self-censorship with upholding corporate social responsibility, proper uh, professional co codes of conduct, and also individual self-discipline. It's, you know, you have to be self-disciplined to set, uh, you know, censor yourself, in other words. And these days, sensitive terms are routinely blocked. A searching Chinese about recent protests in Guangzhou against, you know, political censorship uh, yields no, not much results. In December last year, uh, many of you know, probably Sino uh, Weibo, the Chinese version of Twitter, cre uh, enacted a seven-day delay function for sensitive terms. Just, I mean, imagine not getting a result for seven days. Gosh, Google will go right bankrupt. Uh, and I, I suppose you know, it's the modern-day version of Pony Express. And, and to think about it, it could be used for tool for my, you know, to deter my daughter from getting online. So Facebook and Twitter are censored. So is YouTube, which leads back to the piece of K-pop uh, we sampled at the beginning of my talk. The Ministry of Culture in Korea actually given an award to Google for YouTube's effectiveness as a platform for spreading Korean popular culture. And, and Sai's Gundam style song you know, exploded in, in you know, in large part because his video went, went viral on YouTube, but YouTube is off limits in China, of course. Now, 
Despite China's great firewall, sensitive information does manage to find, you know, surreptitious and, and guerrilla style online existence through various transgressive tactics, uh, such as code breaking, multiple blogging, creative use of terms and phrases, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and also, censorship has had a little impact on the tech savvy professionals and rights activists who actively seek out and also spread information by circumventing the wall. Although recently, China started to crack down on foreign VPNs and other circumventing technology, which makes it harder to climb the wall. But censorship cannot prevail. It cannot eliminate dissent. It would only ferment further discontent as cohesion would eventually lead to rebellion. Now, while trying hard to fend off Western media and information from coming in, the Chinese state somehow imagined that it would be able to push its own media overseas. And in the case of CCTV, right, it's, you know, it launched its official English channel on September 25, 2000. CCTV International rapidly expanded its foreign language services in the last few years, adding Spanish, French, Russian, Arab, and, and Arab and Africa channels to its cocktail of foreign language services. And then came CCTV America. On February 6th of last year, before an official visit to the US of Xi Jinping, uh, China's incoming president, CCTV launched its American outpost, CCTV America, and on February 11, CCTV America's panel showed the heat, which, by the way, is hosted by Michael Walter, gave a preview of Xi Jinping's upcoming uh, stopover in Iowa, the leading soybean producer in the U.S. and big supplier to China. When Chinese Vice President Xi Jinping's itinerary to the United States was announced, it included stopovers in Washington, D.C., California, and also Iowa. It turns out Vice President Xi is keen to revive old connections and meet with friends he made when he spent some time in Iowa 27 years ago. He visited the Hawkeye State as part of an agricultural delegation from the northeastern Hebei province in 1985. Vice President Xi spent two nights in the home of an American family, toured farms, and even watched a baseball game. He also met Iowa Governor Terry Branstad, who says Xi Jinping was pleased by the warmth and friendly reception he received back then and feels a sense of kinship with the people of Iowa. Branstad visited Xi Jinping during a visit to China last September. He says the vice president saved his itinerary from his 1985 Iowa trip and inquired about a number of people he met. Iowa is also critical for another reason. It's exporting a record amount of corn, soybeans, and pork to meet a massive surge in demand by China's growing middle class. Look at the exponential growth in trade over a 10-year period. In 2000, Iowa's exports to China totaled $45 million. By 2010, that rose nearly 13 times to $627 million. What does that do for the job market? Unemployment in Iowa was at 5.6% in December of 2011. The U.S. national average at the same time, 8.5%. Now, CCTV America's vast financial resources uh, have brought or, or bought it, rather than news people from the U.S., U.K., and Australia, uh, but it remains to be seen if viewers, too, uh, can be bought or, or brought along. And CCTV America is highly skewed towards reporting economic and financial news. And when it comes to political news, it actively engages in major events elsewhere, except in China. When it comes to political news about China, CCTV's America branch is highly disciplined, sticking to the party script and reporting only what is permissible. Uh, it is very much on the party's short leash. So when the journalists strike against the censorship of China's you know, sudden weekend became headline news around the world, CCTV America kept silent. And Al Jazeera, on the other hand, has created a brand name for producing intriguing news about the Middle East, which is actually what the CCTV America aspires to be when it comes to news about China. But political editorial makes it impossible for CCTV America to function as a credible and valuable news about China. Now, going to wrap it up a little. Now, China's uh, top-down state-orchestrated soft power campaign has so far shown little impact in altering how the world perceives China. The soft power campaign has failed to account for the power of the grassroots and the popular. 
the paternalistic Chinese state does not get it that if the Chinese back home do not want to be lectured to, the audiences uh, abroad would hardly uh, want to have the same patience to, to listen in. Now, I'm not suggesting here that, that the Ghanam style pop is the only way or even a viable way towards accruing uh, a soft power. China can certainly produce its own brand of soft power, fusing cultures high and low. But whatever it produces, it must resonate with the grassroots and be capable of unleashing individual creativity and aspiration. And, and the leaders, you know, when the, the leaders do lecture, it wouldn't hurt for them to uh, lighten up a little, perhaps to show some emotions and, and be a little more animated. And I want to show you a, a, a clip here, particularly while delivering New Year's greetings. Let's see how the Chinese leaders uh, deliver the New Year's greetings here. Ladies,先生们,同志们, 朋友们，新年钟声就要敲响。二零一三年即将来临，我很高兴通过中国国际广播电台。and then you know what, what, you know what the CCP needs actually is the bouncy and irrepressible Joe Biden to quote the Marine Dow, you know, uh, here's a Biden in action. Let's take a look at what, you know, the Biden in action was like. Hey, mom. Hey, what's this? How story? are you? Good to see you. I'm Joe Biden. Come here. Just put a smile down. Come on, sis, get in here. You got a million dollars. Smile. <laughs> There's a lot to smile about today. You bet. Good looking bunch. Spread your legs, you're going to be <laughs> frisked. I want okay. you next to me. You I want you next to me. <laughs> How are you guys? Good to see you. Come on, let's do this. Right. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You got a smile that lights up the room. This your smile was. lights up the room. <laughs> you got a smile that lights up the whole chamber. Thank you. Mom, you come by me. Mom, how are you? Oh, you look like a sister. <laughs> look, in my house, it was real simple. There's mothers, and then there's something else, and something else, and there's mothers, and then there's mothers. Come on, Mom. Take a chance. Okay. Ruin your reputation here. Mom, do you realize in parts of Arizona, this risks your reputation? <laughs> <laughs> As they say in Southern Delaware, Mom, you've done good with this boy. As they say in Southern Delaware, you've done good, boy, with this girl. As they say in Southern Delaware, you've done good with this boy. I wish I could continue to play this. Uh, and uh, the Joe Biden can be a very good soft power, actually, uh, for the Chinese state. Now, let's get serious here as I uh, wrap up. And I think that the fundamental problem is that the Chinese state has no moral authority in, uh, you know, imparting cultural values here. And ultimately, what needs to be fixed is not just the China's draconian image alone. For China's charm offense to work, it has to shake off its repressive and authoritarian reputation. And for that to happen, it will need to lift political censorship to allow for a very you know, vibrant civil society to emerge. It also need to dismantle the same monopoly of the media so that information channels can, you know, are open to dissent, diversity, and competition. You know, after leaving behind the totalitarian state of Mao's era, China glided uh, through a relatively open face with rapid economic growth and political exploration only to arrive today at a toxic t uh, cocktail of authoritarian and plutocratic rule where money and power converge to guard interests of a few. And for China's soft power to work, China has to first respect and empower its own people. And that's my, you know, today's talk. Thanks very much for uh, having a good ride with me. Happy to take questions. In your book, with the response of the senior um, CCTV individuals and how they were trying to balance commitment with with the different venues they had to satisfy, how do they react to this whole coming out and and soft power? Well, I think uh, you know uh, a lot of the Chinese journalists. Uh, and they, you know, some, some of them are very idealistic. 
uh, and they really do uh, tie their, their success and their aspiration with the success and aspiration of China and globally. So they somehow do tie their fate with the fate of China, so they're also very patriotic. Uh, and so they do want to see China to, to prosper and to become a respectable uh, global player. Uh, but how China is to uh, reach that step, and I think you know, that's uh, another issue. I think they too have their own ideas, and some of them have to struggle with very strict censorship where you know, they can't even express their ideas freely. And, so, and a lot of them have to exercise routinely uh, self-censorship. You know, I use self-censorship as a very sort of just a descriptive term. I'm not condemning uh, self-censorship or uh, being judgmental about it, but, but that's the reality that they face. I think, uh, you know, again, they, there, there's certain aspiration there, but there's a, there's a huge gap between uh, the reality and what they aspire to be. I wonder if you know about the Southern Weekly news that just broke today about uh, yes yes the yes press. the New York Times yeah uh, the Chinese journalists are all coming out saying like we're speaking for freedom of speech and yeah this is a very exciting moment this is actually watershed moment you know uh, the the so-called the Chinese government called these you know uh, demonstrations mass incident in this case this is the first incident that people actually come out uh, gather together to demonstrate against the political censorship and uh, this is a, a you know very exciting moment and in fact, and I uh, was accepting a Boston Globe's interview yesterday, and the question was uh, posed to me, and I expressed my uh, optimism. I think, you know, uh, this is unstoppable. The world has opened, China has opened itself to the world, and China cannot retreat and go back to a dark age. Uh, and, you know, I, I hope that the new leader uh, will step back and think twice before they crack down on these demonstrations. And again, I think it's a great moment, and I personally felt very excited about that. I think you did mention Al Jazeera as like being, you know, the the the, the, the antithesis, if you will, of of um, CCTV. Like, um, what are the short and medium term steps that CCTV can become as reputable and as far reaching as something as Al Jazeera? Well, when the image of China changes, that's the only time you can do that. Right? Two things: one is, you know, the image of China changes, and also China left its censorship. They're all interrelated. You know, you cannot do without the other. So um, the, the sort of the forces that created sort of modern Western uh, ethos and thinking came out of a, a bunch of funny cultural events like the English Civil War and a bunch of fairly horrible experiences that, uh, that we had in the past. And those things sort of drive a lot of things even though we're, we, we're often sort of forgetful of their background. What do you think the, the similar cultural forces or drivers within China uh, need to be or are to sort of bring China to the place where, where you and, and certainly most of us think it ought to go? Because it's not the case that China had something like the English Civil War to kind of wake it up to certain things that it was doing wrong. Uh. Well, we have different events uh, throughout the, you know, the, the, the last centuries. I mean, uh, not, uh, not similar in nature, but, but the, the, the force for, uh, for change, the modernization force, uh, it was, has been there all along, too. Uh, and uh, it's uh, not going back to history, uh, thinking about what at this particular moment, what one might do, what one might seize. You know, uh, clearly, again, going back to internet. Internet has opened the technological revolution. Let's put it this way, technological revolution. Internet has opened the, the whole you know, terrain for, com for competing voices to emerge and, and for information to, to go out at a very fast rate and, and to really make it impossible, really, for uh, uh, you know, censorship to control the information flow. And so that's uh, something that really helps to facilitate this kind of change. Uh, and, and don't forget that in, you know, as recent as in back in 1989, there's a student movement. So that there is a, a mass uh, grassroots demand for change. Uh, and so I'm not sure if I'm answering your questions uh, you know, succinctly, but and, and it's very kind of uh, 
I guess I'm not in a position to really prescribe uh, a certain solutions. Uh, just surface it to say that there are so many incremental changes are there already. And, and it seems to me that China is at, at, its, at, a, at a crossroad, and China is ready to make that leap. In your book, you, you were able to uh, interview uh, many members of the CCTV family who responded with uh, considerable candor. And I wonder, um, uh, were they jeopardizing either their careers or um, any personal safety by, by being so candid with you? Um, and I'm wondering if the book has been banned in China. It'll be interesting to know whether the book has been in China. Uh, you're right. A lot of interviews, those interviews are very candid. And, and first of all, let me say I do not consider uh, these journalists whom I interviewed back in China my research subjects. They're my fellow journalists. You know, uh, uh, and my, I, I felt uh, the king, uh, very keen sense of uh, uh, camaraderie you know, with these people. Uh, and so, these are not interviews per se. These are uh, conversations conducted at various occasions over you know, their own period of time. I do not just go in there and say, you know, put on the, uh, the, the video and audio tape and say, let's talk. No, uh, a lot of conversations conducted over dinner, uh, even over hot pot, right? And so, so, so that, uh, this makes it easier for people to kind of be less guarded and open up. Um, but, but there's a very fine line. And I know, and they know, there are certain questions I cannot ask. Because it's easy for me to come back, leave China, but people who are there have to stay there, right? And they have to, uh, to live, to make a living. So, so I, you know, I, it was delicate, very delicate balance. I very, I'm very careful not to ask certain questions that would be too provocative. And, and also, you know, um, a lot of the, uh, high profile interviewees or uh, my comrades back there, uh, they, you know, they, I, and, and we grew up under the similar uh, cultural condition around the same age. And so there is a uh, mutual understanding there too. So there's a trust there so that they get to open up to me. And I can tell you that I do not, I did not really put everything in that book because I too have to exercise some kind of control as an ethical consideration. So yes, it's very candid, but it also uh, walks a very fine line. It works within the boundary, let's put it that way. Um, as CCTV America tries to project China's soft power, what is its metric for success? Because even in the US, I mean, there's all these different news you know, outlets and organizations and publications, and there's no real consensus on you know, many important issues. So how does CCTV see itself sort of reaching its goal in terms of like changing America's image of China? Well, it'll be interesting if they actually have a goal. Uh, what well, is the goal is very clear, is to, to project itself out. Whether they have a very coherent strategy, I, can, I highly doubt, you know, there is. And, and they really, uh, CCTV America, a lot of CCTV is foreign services, they, they really, uh, 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 straight jacketed by the you know heavy-handed policy uh, interference, so uh, they are not left alone to do to follow their professional uh, instinct to do reporting and so on and so forth. Uh, so I don't think it is a real strategy. Uh, the, in 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 a, in a capital turn in, or in a non-capital turn in a strategy per se. Uh, there's only goal, only wishful thinking that if uh, we have. If we have the financial resources, we can come over and we can set up an outpost there and we can hire your people to broadcast for us and it might soften up this kind of a propaganda tone a little bit. But if you cannot really you know, report uh, the major news items that everybody else is interested in, then you really do not have the cred credibility. Right? So, and uh, if there's a strategy I'm not aware of, and it's certainly not succeeding. 